a big, really important uh, uh, point there where the president laid out the policy, right? He's the one that laid out the policy for senators and congressional members uh, to to really have a, 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 a midterms that did not lead to a red wave, right? We saw what happened in the Senate. Uh, we saw that, yes, uh, Republicans now have Congress, but by slim majority. We were told it was going to be more than 60 seats, and it's not bad at all. And that's because the president went out there, spoke directly to the American people, and laid out what it is that we have done the last two years, how we've built. You've heard uh, from Brian Deese just moments ago. He took many, many questions laying out the president's economic plan, how it's working, but how there's still more work to do, but essentially talking through the different policies, the different policies that became that became legislation, that turned into law. That was, that was historic. And all of those pieces matter. Matter. And I think the State of the Union, he'll have an opportunity to speak directly to the American people, not just Congress, not just Congress, uh, to talk about what we have done uh, the last, what he has done the last two years, and how he sees uh, the future of this country. And so, I'm not going to get into what the person, what the president should respond to. I think, uh, you know, the president always says this: watch him, watch him, and see see what he does. Uh, and I think he has a record over the last two years that shows that he has delivered. And that's the numbers that we're going to pay attention to, right? We're going to pay attention to unemployment, how it's been down uh, more than 53 years, a historic unemployment. We're going to pay attention to uh, more than almost 12 million jobs that has been created under this president. We're going to pay uh, attention to the 800,000 manufacturing jobs that has been created under this president. And I think that's what we're going to continue to work on, and that's what we're going to continue to speak to. Thanks, Green. Um, some uh, State of the Union uh, preparations questions. Uh, can you tell us what the president was doing at Camp David this weekend? Uh, what did those preps look like? Who is he working with? Is he still in major rewrites at this point or just kind of fine-tuning, uh, doing run-throughs? Uh, what, what was the weekend like for him? So one of the things that I said, I said this last week, is that, as you know, when it comes to big speeches like this, there's going to be probably, you know, tweaks and and uh, uh, to the speech until the last minute. That's kind of how, how it goes. Uh, but I'll say more more generally, or actually speaking to your question about Camp David, the president uh, was accompanied by several of his senior aides. Uh, work has has gone into the speech over the course of many, many weeks, as we know, because, again, this is something that the president uh, truly sees as a moment to speak to the American people. And the work continued the weekend, through the weekend, as uh, as, as it did today. Uh, Michael, Donnell, Michael Donnellan was there. Bruce Reed uh, was also there with him. Steve Reschetti, Anita Dunn, and Vinay Reddy, as you all know, he is uh, his uh, his uh, speechwriter, and so that was uh, kind of the makeup uh, of the weekend, and uh, certainly not going to get ahead of, of uh, anything else from here. And, and how does the president <clears throat> approach this speech, given the different dynamic in the House chamber tomorrow night with the Republican majority compared to his speech last year? You know, this is a Republican majority that's launched multiple investigations into his administration. How is he thinking of that as he goes to give this speech tomorrow night? Well, as you know, the president is heavily, uh, as I've said many times, heavily engaged engage in the writing process. When you when you hear the speech, you're certainly here. Uh, there will be no question that this is a Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden State of the Union speech. Uh, so just want to make that really clear. But, you know, don't want to get ahead of what you're going to hear from him. Uh, and so, again, it's going to be about ensuring our accomplishments and what we've done the last two years. He'll talk about that clear, clearly. He'll lay that out. And, you know, and I've also said this before, this is a president that's incredibly optimistic, and he talks about the possibilities. He talks about uh, not betting against the American people. Uh, and so you'll continue to hear those types of uh, kind of uh, uh, themes in his in his speech. But, I, of course, I'm not going to get into specific issues or uh, the, the political moment uh, that we're in uh, as, he, uh, as he's still working through and, and uh, dealing with the speech for tomorrow. Can't fill. Thanks for your <coughs> The administration officials said that after the balloon was shot down, there were communications between the administration and their Chinese counterparts, and kind of detailing maybe rationale and the why. Can you talk about how you guys are thinking through the next steps in this relationship, given the cancellation of Secretary Blinken's visit, um, and obviously that seemed to be a pretty brazen act over the course of the last week? So look, our approach with China has been pretty clear, and we've been very um, 
very clear about this, that, that, and it will be continue to be calm, resol uh, resolute, and, uh, and practical. That is not going to change on how we're going to move forward with our relationship with China, with our di di diplomatic conversations uh, as we move beyond this. Uh, the President has been clear. We have been and will continue to keep open lines of communications uh, with China. As you mentioned, uh, uh, Blinken and Jake Sullivan and many others uh, have uh, have continued those those dialogues, especially after uh, last week. In, in fact, uh, uh, he, uh, like I, I was mentioned, there was multiple levels uh, of uh, a, a conversation about our about their surveillance balloon, and again communicated directly with China after we took uh, our action to bring the balloon down. So again, multiple multiple channels of communication that will continue. Uh, China's, we believe, irresponsible action were were visible for the American and the world to see. Uh, not only that, at the same time, a second PRC surveillance balloon was seen uh, traversing uh, Latin, in Latin America. That's one thing that you all reported. And it's up to China to show it is serious about its words of being a responsible country, uh, that uh, it wants to build a meet, uh, build on the meeting that the president and uh, president had with President Xi very recently. And so it's up to China to, to figure out what kind of relationship that they want. And as you know, yes, uh, uh, Secretary Blinken did did postpone his trip. It was not canceled. Uh, and when the time uh, permits, uh, we'll see that trip back on the books. Uh, but again, it doesn't change our, our what we are trying to do and how we're trying to move with China. It's up to them. And, uh, just one more. On Saturday, when the president spoke uh, just off of Air Force One, he seemed very definitive in making clear that he was the one who said explicitly, I want this to be shot down. The military leader suggested wait. Um, was that a reflection, perhaps, in frustration in terms of the political attacks you guys have gotten from Republicans who said this should have happened on the front end as opposed to the back end? Well, just a couple of things. I know there was a TikTok that went out to all of you uh, from the National Security Council that was pretty detailed on how everything kind of broke down for the past week uh, and how things uh, how things flowed. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little truncated version of that. On Tuesday, the president, through the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, directed the military to refine and present options to shoot the balloon down immediately. The president also directed the military and the intelligence community to collect against the balloon so that we would learn more about China's capabilities and tradecraft. At the same time, we protected uh, we protected against Chinese intelligence collection because we knew exactly where the balloon uh, was going. The, the military recommended taking the balloon down over water fo following the determination uh, by military commanders that there was undue risk of debris causing harm to civilians while the balloon was over land in Alaska, Canada, or the continental United States. On Wednesday, the president directed the military to take it down at the first available opportunity when it could be done with safety, uh, especially uh, as we're thinking about Americans' lives and being safe there while maximizing our ability to recover of the payload. Shooting the balloon down over water wasn't just the safest option. It ma maximized the chance of recovering the payload, giving us a better chance to get information from the Chinese surveillance balloon payload. But I think the bottom line here, and this is something that we want to make very clear, is that, uh, uh, look, what China did was unacceptable. We protected civilians, and we gained more intel while protecting our own sensitive information. And so uh, I, I laid that out so you have an understanding of how the, this past week went. And, you know, the president, as we all know, is not just the president. He's also the commander in chief. And his number one uh, priority is making sure that American lives are are protected and that we protect, uh, you know, uh, citizens in this country. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we were able to collect uh, some data, which we were able to do. And that's why we took that action. And the, pres the president uh, made sure we took that action. Thanks, Karine. Um, how much damage would you think <coughs> has been done to the U.S.-China relationship because of this? And do you expect the president to bring this topic up in his speech tomorrow? Look, um, I will say this. Uh, as we know, when, when it comes to State of the Union speech, you know, foreign policy is always a, a topic in, those, in that speech. I'm not going to get ahead uh, of the president and what he's going to, to speak to uh, as it relates specifically to China. You know, I just laid out at the top that it is going to be up to China. It's up to China to see how they, they want to see this relationship moving forward. And so uh, I'll leave it there. Let me ask you one yep. more broad question about the State of the Union address. We heard Brian Deese's uh, take on the economic terms. Obviously, foreign policy will also be a, a, a theme. Can you just give us a broad brush answer on what does President Biden hope to achieve with the speech tomorrow night? So, you know, 
and I've said this before, so it doesn't, this doesn't change much at all, is that the president sees this moment as a critical moment, an important moment uh, to speak directly to the American people, to talk about the last two years, to talk about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, and that is important to the president. That doesn't change. He's, this is a second State of the Union speech. Uh, certainly not going to get into issues and get ahead of the, the president. Uh, but, uh, you know, the president will underscore the progress we have made during one of the most challenging times, uh, especially in history, and the progress the American people want us to continue to make by working together in this year ahead. Uh, you, just, you just heard from Brian outline how the president has carried out his economic vision, growing the economy from the bottom up and middle out, uh, instead of the, from the top, the top down. One of the things that you have seen this president do, he has transformed how we see the economy, right? When you think about the trickle down, uh, the trickle down uh, economy, he sees it, again, bottom up, middle out. This is something that the president has done with, with the policies that he's put forward. And so that is something that we are going to, he's going, you're going to continue to hear from him, continue to hear from, from him about giving the American people a little bit more of a breathing room, uh, because this is something that he understands personally. So tomorrow is going to be a big opportunity for the president, again, to, to speak directly to the American people, the millions of people who will be watching and who will be wanting to hear uh, from their president. And he takes this incredibly seriously. Ken Michael. Um, so I wonder if I could follow up a little bit on, on Zeke's third question. Um, uh, I think you made the assertion that the reason that there wasn't a red wave, or the reason that the, the elections in the midterms were more successful than <coughs> many people thought they would be for Democrats was because of the president. Is that that's a fair? Yeah, and we've okay. said that before. It's not. It's nothing new. We think we we think the president played a very big role in laying out the message for Democrats. So, so I wonder how, in light of the following poll, you can make that assertion. This is a <coughs> recent NBC poll. Um, is Biden honest and trustworthy? 34% yes, 48% no. Ability to handle a crisis, 30%, 32% yes, 49% no. Competent and effective, 31% yes, 49% no. Has the necessary mental and physical health to be president, 28% yes, 54% no. Uniting the country, 23% yes, 50% no. I mean, G given that poll, which you know is not just a single poll, it's been you know versions of that have been repeated in poll after poll, survey after survey since the midterm elections and before. And and I think one of my colleagues referenced a recent poll that said 60 something percent more Democrats don't want President Biden to be their nominee than Republicans don't want President Trump to be their nominee. So, so given all of that. Why are you so convinced that it was President Biden that caused the Democratic success in the midterms and not that the Democrats had success in spite of the president? Well, I'll say this, because if you look at what uh, candidates, senators, and congressional members ran on, it was the successes that the president had. It was on the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. It was on the CHIPS and Science, and, and Science Act, which was bipartisan because of the president was able uh, to make that happen. It was because of the Inflation Reduction Act. If you hear the message that was coming out of Democrats during uh, the, the, uh, the midterms, it was what we were able to deliver. So yes, in, so that's what they use, right? They used exactly what the president was able to do in order to get that success. And so it is, right, if you think about all of the pieces of, of, of uh, historic legislation that became law clearly uh, that, uh, that, that we did last year, Again, the president led that. And the president went out there and spoke on these uh, very important pieces of historic legislation. When you think about what it's done for the economy, what it's done for the American people, how it's provided some relief, uh, yeah, I think the president did play a big role. So then just one quick follow-up. I mean, I mean, I guess, does it suggest then that maybe the Democrats who were talking about the president's agenda have been more successful at talking about the president's <clears throat> agenda than the president himself well, has been? And, and it, does that make it all the more important tomorrow <clears throat> and, and whatever, whenever the president rolls out his election, re-election campaign, if he does, but does it make it that much more important for the president to somehow find a way to, to, to communicate as effectively as I guess some of these other Democrats were, because obviously, however, however he's communicating now isn't translating. So I'll say, I mean, look, I'll say this, Michael, and Brian, and Brian spoke to this, right? I think he got this question every which way from from uh, your colleagues, and uh, a very important question to ask. 
But I'll say this, we understand, and it is true that the American people are feeling, uh, are feeling in inflation. They're feeling what the pandemic and COVID has, has done, right, the last two, three years. And so we understand that they're going to have um, some feelings about the economy right now. And so that is something that the president has always acknowledged and has said there's always more work to do. But also the reality is, if you look at the data, if you look at uh, how the economy has bounced back because of this work that the president has done, and Brian spoke to this, I have spoke to this, when you think about record 12 million jobs, when you think about unemployment, at the lowest that it's been in 54 years, when you think about the 800,000 manufacturing jobs and how important the Chips and Science Act is going to continue to be as we see manufacturers coming back to the U.S., those are real data points, right? Those are real things uh, that has occurred these past two years, and it's because of the president. Uh, and so, look, we get where the American people are, but what we are going to focus on is are the numbers that I just laid out, and that is also important. Will we continue to need to talk direct to the American people? Absolutely. That's why the State of the Union, we see it as an important moment to lay out for the president, to lay out how he uh, sees uh, the country moving forward, and also to remind folks and lay out what he has done the last two years. There's no easy answer there. I get where you're getting to, uh, but this is an incredibly complicated time. With the president's going to focus on is how he's going to continue to deliver for the American people. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Um, is this the first Chinese balloon that the U.S. identified flying over U.S. airspace under this administration? Um, so what I can say is that um, we have talked about uh, the China's and uh, China's balloon program. Uh, we have um, uh, generally on this, uh, the Chinese surveillance balloons program uh, has been around for some time. We even, uh, we even briefed Congress this past August. Uh, so I don't have any specific on any other balloon during this, uh, during, uh, during this president's administration, but there has been a program that has been in effect. We have kept Congress uh, abreast on that. Uh, so, but that, I don't have anything more to, to, to say or to share. How is it possible that this administration discovered um, at least three previous balloons that flew over the U.S. under the previous administration, but Trump officials didn't know it was happening? Yeah, so look, I think that, uh, and we have talked about this before, about how um, uh, the, when it, um, when the PRC government surveillance balloons trans, uh, trans, trans, transited uh, the continental U.S. briefly at least three times, as you just mentioned during the president's uh, prior administration, and once that we know of the beginning of this administration's, uh, but never for this duration of time, as we know, uh, this information was discovered prior to the admin administration uh, left, uh, but uh, the intelligence community, as I said, is prepared to give, uh, give uh, briefings to key officials, uh, but this is something, uh, this is something, sorry, post, yeah. but this is something that we, we, they did not, they were not aware of, as, as we've just laid out. But again, we are ready to uh, brief key officials to let them know uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what the intelligence community was able to figure out. You can share about how you became aware of it. Like, did you, I'm, is there, I just don't, did you yeah. go back and look at so I'm not going to get into intelligence, commu uh, intelligence uh, community information from here. That's not something that we do from the, the certainly from the briefing room. What I can say is that we learned of this, uh, the three prior during the past administration, uh, and uh, and so we are we are willing to share that information. But again, just not going to get into intelligence from here. Last question on this: Since the administration was aware of the balloon program, did any U.S. officials have conversations with the Chinese? about balloons over U.S. airspace during so, this administration? You know, we're not going to get into specifics of private diplomatic conversations we have with China. We're just not going to do that from here. We've been very clear that what China did was indeed a, a violation of international law. You've heard di directly from uh, Secretary Blinken making that very clear. And uh, China knows that it will, uh, that we will vigorously defend uh, our homeland and sovereignty. That is something that we've also made uh, very clear. Uh, but we're just not going to get into diplomatic conversations from here. Oh. <laughs> what happened? Okay, okay, one or two more. All right, I'm going to go to uh, to the back. Go ahead. Can I ask just about COVID? It took up a lot of real estate in last year's State Union speech. What's going to be different this year? And is the president going to address the yawning gap between vaccinations in the developed world and in the less developed world? As you know, I'm not going to get ahead of the president's speech tomorrow. Uh, 
As it relates to COVID, you know, the president has talked about uh, many times of how uh, we've been able to uh, get the economy going. And a lot of that was because of how the president handled COVID, of how he was able to put forward an American rescue plan that was able to put forward a, a comprehensive plan to get shots in arms. And because of the work that this president has done, we are in a different place. Uh, COVID is not taking over our lives. Uh, we're still fighting COVID, and, and uh, but again, we're in a different place. I'm just not going to get into what the president's going to talk about or say uh, and on any particular issue. We've kind of given the, the, you know, kind of a little bit of, of uh, uh, a little bit of the themes a little bit here. You heard from from Brian. Just not going to get ahead of, of the president from here. I'm going to go ahead. Um, sorry. Oh, <laughs> um, has the president looked to any past state of the union addresses for inspiration as he crafts this one? He's worked with some great orators so uh, <clears throat> years. So not going to go into the into his process. What I can say is the president has been was a senator for 36 years. He was vice president for eight years. He was has been president for two. He knows how this process is. He knows how it works. Uh, he knows uh, how important tomorrow is going to be. Uh, and he is uh, when you hear the speech is going to sound like a Joe Biden State of the Union speech. So I can definitely uh, assure you on that. Just not going to get beyond that. Go ahead, the person behind you. Thank you. So, Karine, um, we know of these few balloons that had flown in the past, the one of course from last week. You say the relationship is up to China going forward. Should the expectation be for the American public that that this is it with balloons then? Or is it that this could potentially happen again in the future? And if that's the case, that the standard procedure going forward is wait for it to get over water and then it'll be shot. I, I, I'm not going to get into any you know, specifics of what might happen next or hypotheticals from here. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Uh, what I can say is, as you've heard me say, there is a, uh, there was a China surveillance program, right, balloon program that we have, uh, uh, that has been going on for some time that Congress certainly was briefed on back in late, in last August. Uh, but just, na just not going to get into hypotheticals from here. And then one more. Um, there are, there's bipartisan calls up on Capitol Hill as it relates to TikTok and the national security implications of it. You have uh, Congressman Ken Buck saying, if you think of, if you see the CCP surveillance balloon scares you, wait until you hear about TikTok. Senator Michael Bennett had recently called on the CEOs of Apple and Google to remove TikTok from their, uh, from their devices, from their Google Play stores and, and Apple Play store. Does the administration believe that TikTok is a national security threat, and does it believe that those apps should be removed from, from phones? So look, the president, uh, the, the Biden administration, more, uh, more broadly, has, has never allowed TikTok on the White House devices. Other fe federal agencies have similar restriction. Uh, we have been cle clear about uh, our concerns on apps like TikTok. Uh, and so, look, we are focused on uh, the, ch the challenges of, of certain countries, including China, seeking uh, to leverage digital te technologies and Americans data in ways that present unaccountable uh, unacceptable national security risk I'm just not going to get ahead of it as we know there's a review currently happening uh, but we take this very seriously and as I said the Biden administration uh, has never allowed TikTok on on the White House uh, on the White House devices Is it a national security risk? Uh, again I'm just not gonna there's a review happening by uh, CFIUS I'm just not going to get ahead of that Thanks, okay Thanks. all right Thank, thank you much. thank you so much is there any reason why you want to against me and other colleagues in the British room?